revealed in upcoming episodes of this program are the contents of a recently unearthed repository classified by the secret government, the Phenomenon Archives. Was our race genetically engineered 6,000 years ago? Were we created by beings from distant space to work as laborers toward some unknown end? From ancient cave paintings to the conquest of space, we have grappled with the truths of our beginnings. But what if the question of our origin falls outside the realm of social acceptability? What would happen to our culture if we were to discover that we, as a race, are no more than the result of a genetic experiment conducted by a superior life form. Over the course of the 20th century, we have witnessed exponential advancements in the collective knowledge of mankind. In every field of science and technology, our achievements are no longer measured in centuries or decades, but in years and even months. With this extraordinary growth, mankind has surpassed every achievement recorded throughout the millennia of known civilization. But what if the breakthroughs of today concerning humanity, the Earth, and our beginnings are not new wisdom at all? What if much of this supposed recent knowledge lay secreted away in the ruins of a once powerful society, awaiting our discovery? Could this alleged new knowledge, uncovered in Earth's little corner of the universe, be considered Genesis Revisited. This is the belief of the world-renowned archaeologist, linguist, and expert in the field of cultural anthropology, Zechariah Sitchin. I am Zechariah Sitchin. I devoted a lifetime to the study of ancient civilizations, ancient languages, their art, their beliefs, and the knowledge that they had. And the question is, when you study, when you look at all that, is it myth, is it mythology, or did it really happen? I believe it all really happened. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? And space is the inescapable challenge to all the advanced nations of the Earth and who established the United States as the preeminent space-faring nation. First for the coming decade, for the 1990s, space station freedom, and next for the new century, back to the moon, back to the future, and this time, back to stay. And then a journey into tomorrow, a journey to another planet, a manned mission to Mars. A manned mission to Mars? An ambitious objective, and with the success of the Mars probes and NASA's rover, one that humanity has made substantial strides toward achieving. Could there have been a space base on Mars in antiquity? If we had physical, tangible evidence of, of artifacts on Mars, we are not only not alone in the universe, but someone has been on the next planet over. That in itself will, will forever change our frame of reference. Mankind came out of the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, reached the Age of Enlightenment, experienced the Industrial Revolution, and entered the era of advanced technology. 
the era of genetic engineering, and the era of spaceflight. Nice shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, drift. We copy you down, Eagle. The Eagle has landed. Astronauts who land like eagles. Zechariah Sitchin's research reveals that in our ancient past, there were advanced beings referred to as the Anunnaki, translated, those who from heaven to earth came. The idea that there was in our solar system a race of intelligent beings far older than us who are now gone would certainly force us to rethink lots of questions, including the question of human origins. Where did we come from? Could we be the products of genetic engineering? The hypothesis that modern science is only now catching up with ancient knowledge is inspiring scientists and researchers to increase efforts to rediscover that which may have been lost over time. It rekindles a situation that has lain dormant almost 5,500 years. The incident of the Tower of Babel. In the Babylonian version of the biblical story, the people of Babylon were building a tower whose head shall reach the heaven, in which a Shem, a space rocket, was to be installed under the direction of their supreme god. But the other deities were not amused by this foray of mankind into the space age. The biblical story recalls that Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower that the humans were building, and he said to his colleagues in Genesis chapter 11, this is just the beginning of their undertakings. From now on, anything that they shall scheme to do shall no longer be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they should not understand each other's speech. Thanks to the science of archaeology, experts now know that the first great civilization emerged almost 6,000 years ago. Older than the Greeks. Older than the Mayans older than the Incas. The people of this society were called Sumerians, after their land, Sumer, in the great plain between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, today's Iraq. The book of Genesis calls the land Shiniar. For generations, biblical scholars either ignore biblical references to ancient kingdoms or categorize these as legend or lore. Through the study of historical relics and the translation of ancient languages, many biblical researchers now believe that the previously questioned Old Testament references are indeed historically authentic accounts of flourishing, advanced cultures. If you study the Genesis document, uh, you know, the, God uh, made Adam out of clay and then took Eve out of his rib, uh, one of his ribs, etc. Uh, if you study this document, you discover that it is really a, a much shorter version of a much more complicated document that comes out of Babylonia and, and then out of Sumer and so on. Now, these ancient texts are give a really complicated story of powerful, uh, non-human, godlike beings actually engineering us, making us uh, with, for specific purposes. Until its discovery only 150 years ago, Erech was known only through passages in the Bible. The temple is dedicated to a female goddess named Inanni, also referred to in later times as Ishtar. Zechariah Sitch. You can see here her features a little damaged. Her divinity was marked by the pair of horns that she had. Uh, she held a jar with the water of life and uh, she was surrounded as a decoration, but perhaps also symbolically, with a symbol that some refer to as entwined snakes, which was the symbol of science in, in those days, 6,000 years ago. Uh, some find in it a precursor of the Egyptian Anch, which was the symbol of life and creation. Further results of Mr. Sitchin's research affirm the theory that this visage of entwined snakes is the symbol for genetic manipulation of DNA. Carved out in stone over 6,000 years ago, Ishtar is sometimes depicted flying through the sky and leaving the Earth's atmosphere to traverse the heavens. In ancient Mesopotamia, the secrets of astronomy and other celestial knowledge 
are kept carefully guarded, studied behind closed doors by an exclusive society of priest astronomers. Cylinder seals like these are the only surviving record of these carefully guarded secrets. This clay tablet carries the print of a cylinder seal about 4,500 years old. It depicts the god Enlil granting the plow to humankind, ushering in the age of modern agriculture. On closer inspection, something completely remarkable can be seen. A detailed depiction of the complete solar system configured identically to that known to contemporary science. With the sun prominently figured in the center, each planet appears in its correct position and relative proportions to the other planetary bodies. On the outskirts is one additional planet, a tenth not currently located by astronomers of our modern era. Astronomers around the world are on the lookout for this evasive celestial sphere, as a growing body of physical evidence indicates that it does in fact exist. History records the discovery of the planet Pluto as February 18, 1930, by astronomer Clyde Tombaugh. Yet, Pluto is clearly shown on the imprint taken from the Sumerian cylinder seal. There is also one additional planet, the one that scientists refer to as the mysterious planet X, the yet undiscovered most distant member of our solar system. According to modern science, Prior to the invention of the telescope in the 1600s, humanity had no knowledge of outlying planets beyond Jupiter, as these bodies cannot be viewed with the naked eye. Since the day of Galileo Galilei, optical astronomers have amassed an important body of knowledge about the outer planets. These theories established by astronomers from around the globe have been uncontested these last centuries. With the technological advancements of our day, new vantage points have developed such as the unobstructed view of NASA's Hubble telescope and the perspective gained through unmanned probes sent on reconnaissance missions to the outer reaches of our solar system. These breakthroughs in space exploration reveal many inaccuracies in earlier astronomical conclusions. On August 19, 1977, the American space probe Voyager 2 leaves Cape Canaveral on a several year journey to the vicinity of this solar system's most distant planets. The Voyager's discoveries challenge many of astronomy's recent conclusions while fully corroborating ancient knowledge. For the first time, we see images of Uranus. Astonishing, it is exactly as the Sumerians report in their 6,000 year old description. Though they have no telescopes that we know of, the Sumerians characterize Uranus as Mash Sig, translated bright greenish. They also explain the unique planetary tilt of Uranus. According to the Sumerians, our solar system was invaded by a planetary body that caused collisions and disrupted the existing order. NASA scientists concur that a collision with a body the size of Earth traveling at 40,000 miles per hour could have caused both the orbital skew of Uranus and the devastation apparent from the planet's surface scarring. Its neighbor Neptune was described as a blue-green planet by the Sumerians millennia ago, but science has only confirmed this fact during the past few decades. The Sumerians named and listed all of the planets in our solar system. Their documented list of these planets is tangible evidence that in at least one respect, modern man is on a path of rediscovery. That ancient knowledge included the planets Uranus and Neptune, supposedly unknown until discovered in 1781 and 1846, and even Pluto, not discovered until 1930. Neptune, Nudimud, the artful creator, Uranus, Anu, he of the heavens, Saturn, Anshar, foremost of the heavens, Jupiter, Kishar, foremost of firm lands, the asteroid belt, Rakish, the hammered bracelet, Mars, Lamu, god of war, and Ki, Earth what the Sumerians considered to be the seventh planet. Why the seventh planet? 
Why not the third, as Earth is so often referred to in modern parlance? Sumerian records indicate that they began their counting not from the sun, but from a planet on the outside of the solar system. But most surprising was the inclusion of one more large planet as the 12th member of our solar system. The launch of Pioneer 10 in 1972 ushers in the era of deep space exploration. The craft journeys beyond the outer known planets, sending back data that is used to seek a possible 10th planet. 14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced the hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system. Over the past two decades, physicists have joined astronomers in the search for the mysterious Planet X. Now, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra. But if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if, if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then its, its mass will be correspondingly larger. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto. And this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the 10th planet. And here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. If planet X exists, we are not alone in this solar system. Earth, the seventh planet. The sacred number seven, seven days in the week, seven days of Genesis, seven tablets of creation. A case can be made for historical coincidence, but to Zechariah Sitchin, this kind of numeric repetition points to more than just legend. Whichever way you look at it, the facts about this 10th planet are nothing less than astonishing. The story of this planet, as told by the Sumerians on their seven tablets of creation, begins four billion years ago when our solar system was much younger and our own planet Earth did not yet exist. The surviving historical records of the Sumerians reveal the story of an intruder planet, Nibiru, which appeared out of deep space, drawn into the center of our solar system by the planetary pull of Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. On an opposing orbital path with the seventh planet, a planet referred to in Sumerian records as Tiamat, Nibiru's new orbit around the sun placed the two planets on a collision course. Sumerian cosmogony answers many puzzles that still baffle modern science. Central to it was the tale of a celestial collision and knowledge of a solar system with 12 members. As they draw near, one of the satellites of Nibiru crashes into Tiamat, cracking the planet. Subsequent collisions smash half of Tiamat completely, breaking the pieces into what develops mostly into the asteroid belt. This is referred to in the Bible and Sumerian text as the firmament. The other half of Tiamat becomes Earth. The Earth is thrust into a new orbital position, carrying with it Tiamat's main satellite, our moon. Nibiru, the intruder, is cast into a permanent clockwise silver orbit, returning to Earth's neighborhood once each 3,600 years, forever becoming the 12th member of our solar system. This tale of creation 
echoed through all the ancient cultures, becoming part of the scientific knowledge that we find in the Old Testament, in the creation story of Genesis. In the aftermath of the collision, the biblical creator Elohim proclaims, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. If earth is the orbital remains of a planetary collision, scientists believe that the most obvious place to look for planetary scarring is seven miles below the surface of the Pacific Ocean. When in the heights heavens had not been named, and below earth had not been called, Naught but primordial Apsu, their begetter, Mamu, and Tiamat, she who bore them all. Their waters were mingled together. Two planets mingled together. The biblical passage of Genesis reads, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. If we apply the knowledge of the Mesopotamian text to the biblical text, the correct reading of the book of Genesis emerges, especially in relation to waters. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament, dividing the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. Upper waters? Lower waters? What does the Bible mean by this? The Sumerians describe Uranus and Neptune as watery planets. What are the conclusions of modern science? In 1979, 1980, and 1981, Pioneer and Voyager visit Jupiter and Saturn with their many moons. During these missions, water is discovered virtually everywhere, as ice on the surface, and as water below the surface. The Sumerians' ancient claim of water on Jupiter's moons Io and Europa is proven. The Sumerian records indicate water on Enceladus and Tethys, two of the moons of Saturn, and in that planet's spectacular rings. The findings of NASA confirm these ancient Sumerian assertions, giving further credence and clarity to the biblical quote, waters above the firmament. Halley's comet travels through space, itself a spectacular confirmation of the biblical claim, waters above the firmament. Nearly four billion years old, with a core half the size of Manhattan Island, this mystic traveler throws off water at the rate of 30 to 70 tons a second, with enough mass to continue its purge for thousands of years. Was ancient man aware of this spectral vision? The unusual celestial object reported in Babylonian texts to have been seen in the year 164 BC is believed to have been Halley's Comet. Significantly, it was considered the scepter star of Israel. In the Bible, the book of Numbers records, I see it, though not now. I behold it, though it is not near. A star of Jacob did course. The scepter of Israel did arise. Halley's Comet and its likes are truly the messengers of Genesis. When the 19th century astronomer Schiaparelli announced that he had seen canals on Mars, he was ridiculed. So too was the respected American astronomer Lowell in 1916. When NASA's unmanned spacecraft visits Mars in the 70s and again in the 90s, ample evidence of water in that planet's past is revealed. Images from expeditions to Venus and Mars exhibit visual evidence of dry sea, lake, and riverbeds characteristic of the biblical reference, waters above the firmament. Even Mercury, so close to the sun, seems to have had a watery past, yet maintaining ice at its polar caps. The NASA report reads, quote, 
we are forced to no other conclusion but that we are seeing the effects of water on Mars, unquote. And, quote, Mars once had enough water to form a layer several meters deep over the whole surface of the planet, unquote. What we previously believed to be a dry and barren planet unexpectedly emerges as a planet where water once existed in abundance. Mars joins Venus, Mercury, the Earth, and most recently the Earth's moon in corroborating the Sumerian concept of water below the firmament. With the discovery of water on the moon and distant planets, the possibility of colonization suddenly becomes much more viable. Oxygen can be extracted from the water to be used in domed habitats on planets with minimal atmosphere. And water is one of the principal ingredients of rocket fuel. This find increases the possibility of unlimited treks across the stars. We've had reports to the effect that the Viking equipment will never determine positively whether or not there's life on Mars. Can you set us straight on this? Well, my own view is it's uh, much too soon to decide whether we will have a definitive answer. Uh, it may be that there is uh, an exotic biology on Mars. It may be that there's an exotic chemistry which looks a little bit like biology. There's a number of experiments to be done. They might decide the issue, they might not. But either way, Viking has been a biological success because uh, the chemical explanation means that there is a kind of chemistry in the Martian surface which simulates some of the steps of chemistry in biology. We would learn something important about the origin of life. In October 1988, the Soviet Union sends two unmanned spacecraft, Phobos 1 and 2, named for one of the Martian moons, to study the red planet. Phobos 1 is lost while on its way to Mars. But Phobos 2 arrives to orbit Mars and immediately sends images back to Earth. On March 1st, 1989, pictures of this unusual grid are received. The grid, here in the upper right, is shot both in the optical range and in the infrared range. Later, they are merged into this composite overlay. On March 26th, Phobos 2 sends these images to Earth, taken just south of the equator. An unexplained elliptical shape appears. This shadow actually appeared all of a sudden. Why am I calling it the shadow? Because you can see things through it. This elliptical shadow then, is it in Mars atmosphere or on the planet's surface? One thing is for sure, this something is not positioned horizontally. Well, to me it looks like a rocket taking off from the surface of Mars and leaving a trail behind. Well, if you'd want to fantasize, it could be interpreted that way too. Now we think we ought to look at the real circumstances that have caused that trail, even though they haven't yet been fully clarified. That's more likely to be the shadow of some object, since surface elements can be seen through it. How long will it take to process all of the information to get more or less objective scientific results, rather than fantastic ones? Come back in a week. One week later, no details are given. Then, unexpectedly, this report. Last year, the Soviets launched two spacecraft to the planet, both named after the Martian moon, Phobos. Their mission was to photograph Mars and land probes on its moon. One was accidentally switched off by a mission operator. But the second reached Mars and transmitted pictures that are still puzzling Soviet scientists. As it swung over the equator, it took pictures from a height of 6,000 kilometers. This is an infrared photograph. It shows differences in temperature. The dark patches are colder. This section covers 600 kilometers. It shows objects down to the size of two kilometers. It's the most detailed infrared picture of the planet's surface. We have some very, very thin lines on the surface of Mars in the infrared, which means it's heat. I mean, it's not visible, it's heat. You can see it through clouds if you want to do it. These have a resolution, these have a width, I would guess, of three or four kilometers wide. You know, not to the question of what it is. I certainly don't know, and the Russians aren't telling us. Scientists are also puzzled by this shadow pictured on the surface of Mars by both optical and heat-seeking cameras. They're convinced it's a shadow because they can see objects on the surface beneath. But a shadow of what? Finally, there's the mystery of the vanishing spacecraft. The Russians have yet to release the last picture transmitted by Phobos before it lost contact with ground control. But the Russians have said that it shows an object coming towards the spacecraft, an object which, in their words, should not have been there. The spacecraft was circling Mars, coming into the same orbit as the moons of Mars. 
and the last picture, about they got halfway through it, and they saw something there which shouldn't be there. Professor Kapitza makes the joke that it's Martian people. British scientists will be able to judge for themselves when the Soviets bring their pictures to a conference at Exeter next month. Because, of course, there must be a sensible explanation, mustn't there? The Russians do not bring any pictures to the Exeter conference. How does the Russian space agency explain the spacecraft's destruction or disappearance? It does take a minimum of precision criteria to obtain on the image these spots, which uh, some would like to call flying saucers, that appeared within the visual field of the infrared range. It must be pointed out that the flying saucer version is not ours. Actually, at first we were saying that there was no flying saucer, that surely all that we saw could be explained in understandable, natural and physical terms. One possibility could easily be that a small meteorite, a small bit of rock, was in the same orbit of Phobos and hit it. In an exclusive interview conducted in October 1990 in Moscow, Professor Lev Mukin of the Soviet Space Research Institute discredits the meteorite theory. There were attempts to hypothesize that there had been a collision between the space probe, which was then orbiting Mars in alignment with the orbit of Mars Moonlet, and strands of dust surrounding the moon Phobos itself. But some fairly accurate computations made by several organizations, and by our institute as well, have shown that this assumption is totally baseless. If not meteorite or debris, then what could possibly explain the mishap? A long silence follows. Then in December 1991, Marina Popovich, former cosmonaut trainee and retired Air Force colonel, holds a surprise press conference at the Russian consulate in San Francisco. She unearths the mysterious last photograph taken by Phobos. There is a strange shape in the foreground. Colonel Popovich refers to this as an unidentified flying object, a UFO. The object is juxtaposed against what appears to be the planet's tiny moonlet, Phobos, for which the craft is named. But how is the mysterious shadow explained? The Russians say it is a shadow of some object on or just above the Martian surface. Upon further examination in April 1992, when all of the related photographs are compared side by side, scientists reach the conclusion that the shadow is actually moving. If Mars was indeed the site of a space base in antiquity, could the failure of these Soviet space missions be attributed to some sort of alien intervention? Could the ancient space base have been reactivated? So the mystery remains, what caused the spacecraft to destabilize? Was it a malfunction or was there an outside cause, perhaps an impact? The question that arises is indeed a simple one. Was the spacecraft Phobos II hit by something that put it out of commission? The circumstances in which Phobos II was lost suggest that someone might be back on Mars, someone ready to knock out what to them is an alien spacecraft. Was Phobos deactivated by intelligent beings wishing to protect themselves from outsiders? Or perhaps there's some other more conventional explanation? We may never know. But indulging the possibilities of otherworldly visitors in the present will help us acclimate to their differences if and when they finally do come calling. The question remains, how would we as a culture respond to incontrovertible evidence of a species of beings that not only preceded our own but actually engineered mankind. Of all the elusive mysteries, the greatest is the riddle of life itself. How did it begin? From what corner of the universe did the first emanations of existence arise? Was the seed of life carried to Earth from the planet Nibiru? There has been a, a blending of interest in biologists on one hand and planetary astronomers on the other in the question of the origin of life. Because the same questions about how life originated on Earth 
also would apply to Mars or some other, ga other solar system. And just as they really can't explain how life originated on Earth, th they don't really know how it or originated elsewhere. Contemporary scientific thinking cautiously asserts that life arrives on Earth when certain chemical substances crash into the surface aboard a stray comet early in our planet's history. See, what we are trying to find out in the meteorites is to see whether there are any of these molecules related to life. There are certain molecules like the amino acids which may be described as the building blocks of life. Directed panospermia Another scientific theory suggests that life on Earth is seeded by a race of beings from outside the planet, not by chance, but as the deliberate activity of an otherworldly society. The Bible suggests that the creation of humankind comes at the end of a long list. All the fishes of the sea, and all the fowl that fly the skies, and all the animals that fill the earth, and all the creeping things that crawl upon the earth. It was only then that Elohim created the Adam. In the last few pages of the story of creation, the Sumerians point to the Anunnaki as the creators of mankind, our own benefactors of life. According to Sumerian text, the Anunnaki, in advance of landing 445,000 years ago, sent androids to scout the earth. 150,000 years later, the Anunnaki themselves arrive and create humankind. How was Adam created? According to the Sumerians, it was by genetic engineering, fertilization in vitro, in a glass tube, as depicted in this cylinder seal rendering. Adam was the first test tube baby. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible reads, let us make the Adam in our image and likeness. But why? Sumerian documentation suggests the Anunnaki create humanity to assist in mining African gold that they need to save the dwindling atmosphere of their home planet, Nibiru. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the, the three great Western traditions, religious traditions, are all founded on the idea of there's, that there's something special about human beings. We didn't arrive here accidentally, so we're not just some uh, consequence of billions of years of pointless uh, accidental permutations of life forms. No, we were created in the image of God. The creation really is about the process of our salvation. Now, what if it were the case that there were creatures both technologically more advanced than us, older than us in terms of their civilization, and maybe even more intelligent than us? and more spiritually advanced, if we could imagine that, then would this cause the creation story to collapse and, and leaving, you know, literally billions of people on the planet totally confused about the meaning of life. The Bible relates an incident of mankind overstepping the bounds of the Anunnaki when the Babylonians attempt to reach the gods by building an enormous launch pad in the archetypal story of the Great Tower of Babel. What is the target of their efforts? According to Zechariah Sitchin, it is our neighboring planet Mars, home of the Anunnaki's way station en route to Earth. The Sumerian tablets refer to the station planet Mars as the traveler's ship. I've taken it to mean that it was at Mars that the Anunnaki from Nibiru transferred to smaller spacecraft to reach Earth orbiting stations not once every 3,600 years, but on a more frequent schedule. Mesopotamian archives identify the 12 members of our solar system with specific symbols. Some, like Mars, Earth, and Venus, are indicated numerically on this ancient stella. We see the sun with its many rays. We see another four depicted standing on their cult animals, but really it's a symbolism connected with the zodiac. We see the moon and we see the earth symbolized by the seven dots, which indicated the position of the earth from the outer limits of the solar system counting or coming in inwards by somebody flying into from outer space. 
The seven dots of Earth with its crescent moon and the six-pointed star of Mars are revealing clues in this 4,500-year-old Sumerian depiction. Two figures stand on either side of a craft. Some researchers believe that Mars was habitable as little as 10,000 years ago. A tenth planet, a mysterious species with the technology to genetically engineer humankind. A few years ago, most of us would have laughed at these ideas, but after the cloning of Dolly the sheep and some of the breakthroughs in genetic engineering, these concepts begin to sound more plausible. When we come back, we'll look at some photographic evidence that raises more serious questions about what the mysterious Anunnaki may have left behind. When the United States launches the Mariner and Viking spacecraft to explore Mars in the 60s and 70s, enigmatic structures resembling those on Earth are photographed. This is a feature on Mars that NASA names the Inca City. Here we see it compared with Sacsayhuaman, Peru. These are lines on the Mars surface. These are the Nazca lines in Peru. I feel that what has been discovered so far is very suggestive of intelligent layout, uh, but it would be irresponsible of me to say, I have proof. What I have is evidence which makes it appear as though it's been designed by some kind of intelligent thinking process, which is pr probably even more advanced than our current in some ways. I was especially intrigued by independent researchers' suggestions in their reports that the orientation of the face and adjoining pyramid indicated they were built in alignment with sunrise at solstice time on Mars about 450,000 years ago. Could it be that a civilization capable of space travel almost half a million years ago visited this part of the solar system, leaving behind monuments on Earth and Mars? The only beings mentioned by name are the Anunnaki. The only evidence supporting such a theory is evidence of visits by the Anunnaki. We have seen uh, societies on Earth that have been demolished by um, cultural cross-representation, if you like. Meeting a more advanced culture has had a, a severe impact on, on, on an existing culture. But I think we, we're intelligent enough to be prepared for that. Our civilization is technologically able to venture out into deep space on scientific quests of discovery. Can anyone then deny the possibility that members from a technologically more advanced world may have visited our solar system thousands of years ago? Thanks to the work of Zechariah Sechen and others like him, we know more than we ever have about ancient cultures and the life that came before. Is this Genesis revisited? Did the Sumerians in their ancient tablets reveal that we're only now catching up with ancient knowledge? Do the discoveries making headlines today originate with our ancient ancestors? Was this ancient knowledge given to the people of Sumeria by those distant explorers from the mysterious 10th planet, Nibiru, the Anunnaki? The final answers may lay buried in those yet to be uncovered volumes of the Phenomenon Archives.